Hi everyone, my name is Johanna Kamm. Um, I'm a senior researcher specializing in EU law and state aid law at the Foundation for Environmental Energy Law, the Stiftung Umweltenergierecht. Uh, we are a non-profit research institute dedicated to researching the legal framework for the energy transition and on how to achieve our climate protection goals. This means in our daily work, we examine how the laws need to be redesigned and provide practical and custom fit models for the public and, and all other stakeholders uh, relevant of the, for the energy transition. And today I would like to give you an overview of the EU Green Deal and how European law is being shaped to make the EU climate neutral. Um, the EU Green Deal, which you probably already heard of, was launched in December 2019 and it is a package of policy initiatives with the goal of achieving climate neutrality by 2050. And as you can see by the showcase policy areas of in this illustration of the European Commission, uh, the EU Green Deal has a holistic and cross-sectoral approach because it was recognized that in order to become climate neutral, all sectors must undergo substantial transformation. First, the package covers climate, environment, energy, transport, industry, agriculture, and sustainable finance. And of course, all of these sectors are closely interlinked, meaning a sustainable finance framework needs to make sure that public and private capital goes into uh, sustainable activities or the uh, sustainable transport sector needs um, a renewable energy uh, in order to be powered uh, accordingly. And for now, this we have this political ambition. In its nature, the EU Green Deal is a communication, so it's not binding in its way, but more a statement. This is where we want to get at. This is where we want to become as a sustainable uh, European Union. Uh, so how does this go into legal obligation? And the most important cornerstone of, of that is the EU climate law regulation, which transforms this political goal into legal obligation, setting a uh, goal for 2050 to become climate neutral, but also setting intermediate targets. Uh, the 2030 target uh, to reduce uh, net house to reduce net greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55 percent compared to 1990 levels. Um, it also contains a process for a separate 2040 target, which has not been set yet because it also uh, relies upon the indicative greenhouse gas budget from 2030 onwards and measures to keep track of the progress in becoming climate neutral and adjust accordingly. Uh, how do we somehow achieve those goals that are now legal obligation? And for this, Article 2 of the uh, Climate Law Regulation states that the uh, relevant union institutions and the member states shall take the necessary measures at union and national level to enable the collective achievement of the climate neutrality objective. And on the next slide, I want to um, give you a bit more background on how this cooperation works because there's a complex interplay in European law and national law, because some areas of the energy policy fall under shared or exclusive EU competence. Um, the reason for that is that the EU has legislative powers only in those areas and only to the extent, uh, extent that legislative competences are conferred to the European Union by the treaties and the member states remain masters of the treaties. Powers not conferred to the European Union remain with the member states. And in the area of climate and energy law, the EU has numerous competences in the form of shared competence. This means that if the EU takes action, member states can no longer take action unless they go beyond the EU's minimum regulations. And um, this means in, in practice that the EU has two uh, options for action, a direct and a indirect action. Uh, direct action, they mostly do uh, via regulations. Uh, re regulations as a legal act are directly applicable and binding in all member states. Uh, one example for that in the area of climate and energy law would be the EU emissions trading system, which sets a single EU-wide carbon pricing scheme that applies equally to all covered entities, no matter in which uh, member state they are at. 
Most of the measures, however, um, are concrete, uh, have the concretization at national level. Um, here, the EU can set a directive as a legislation, um, and those directives must be transposed into national law by the member states. So a directive set out certain goals or results that must be achieved, but each member state has some leeway in deciding on how to implement measures and transpose them into national law. This is also important to understand that, um, for example, you, you might come across a national, regula national law uh, relevant to your work, uh, which might have its origins in a European directive. So you cannot really, so you really need to know the background on, on where the law actually comes from. Uh, one example for that would be the Renewable Energy Directive, which sets a binding renewable energy target for each member state. But each country has the flexibility, uh, flexibility to, to decide how to achieve that target. And another very practical uh, practice, important example uh, would be the design of national support programs, because member states can obviously decide if and how, most of the <laughs> most importantly if, but also how um, they want to fund certain renewable energy business models or something but they have to obey uh, or be in compliance with the criteria set out by EU European state aid law. So um, there is this complex interplay which you have to take into account. And on the next slide, I want to give you some uh, some well overview on, on the density or what this means, how much uh, regulation we have in the European in the energy sector on the way to becoming climate neutral. I've already introduced to you the EU climate law, which came into force in 2021, and uh, the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 55% until 2030. So how does this uh, transpose into real law and, and instruments and pathways? For this, the European Commission has, in 2021, uh, proposed the Fit for 55 package. Uh, this is a package of legislative proposals covering all relevant sectors. And uh, propose, basically, it proposes a policy mix that includes regulatory measures, as well as market instruments, as, like CO2 pricing as well as instruments at the European level and targets for member states. So in the area of CO2 pricing, don't worry, I won't um, explain all those uh, legislative acts to you, but I want to give you some overview on, on what is actually happening. Uh, in the area of CO2 pricing, um, it, um, a revision of the EU emissions trading tr uh, directive is proposed. Uh, with the most important thing that it is uh, that uh, the EU plans to also extend uh, the emissions trading to the buildings and transport sector. And it also contains new legislative proposals which have not been part of the European framework so far. Uh, for example, the carbon border adjustment mechanism regulation addressing carbon leakage, meaning businesses might uh, take their business outside of the European Union because they're in other countries, they might not have some CO2 pricing. And the EU Climate Social Fund that wants to address um, social injustices that might arise out of CO2 pricing. Uh, if, for example, the building sector is also covered by CO2 pricing, then it is hard for tenants who cannot renovate a house and only have a limited way of being energy efficient uh, without the cooperation of the landlord. So they are not, um, well, they, they are not at, put at a disadvantage. Another very important policy area would be uh, clean energy. Here, an amendment of the Renewable Energies Directive is proposed as well as um, recasts that make energy efficiency and uh, in general and as also in buildings more strict and more binding for member states. The third important pillar would be the transport sector. Here we have uh, in current negotiations uh, because at the moment most of those proposals are still at the negotiation level and not uh, already into for in force. Uh, we have an amendment to the regulation setting CO2 emission standards for cars and vans, meaning that 
from 2035 onwards, it is proposed at the moment that no new cars are allowed to emit CO2, new cars only. And um, the Commission is hoping that this will also help with the 2030 target because then maybe people in 2028 won't buy a emitting car because after 2035 uh, they have uh, different rules. And underlined or underpinned by all this is a rework of the guidelines on state aid for climate environmental protection and energy, um, setting more st stringent rules and more in line with Fit for 55 and the Cre EU Green Deal for national state aid programs. But um, as you all know, the world has changed a bit since 2021. So um, all those proposals made in Good Five on the on the then current State of Union um, have changed through the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the resulting energy price crisis uh, we had in the European Union. Uh, for this, um, this means that all those legislative proposals also have to be adjusted into um, uh, the Repower EU plan, uh, which wants to accelerate this transition to clean energy and also uh, sets more focus on becoming independent of uh, Russian uh, fossil fuels, uh, meaning that clean, the Renewable Energy Directive will be stricter and um, there will be sp there are special state aid uh, rules at the moment. And in the further on, we have another adjustment through the Green Deal Industrial Plan, uh, a plan that was introduced by the European Commission in February, um, which aims to secure the EU industrial leadership in CO2 neutral technologies by boosting competitiveness and encouraging investments um, so like the EU Green Deal, the Repower EU plan and the industrial plan are further announcements of legislative proposals, reforms and guidelines. So with this, I think I filled the slide to the maximum and I hope I could give you some overview on how um, the legal framework for the path to climate neutrality is built. Many thanks for your attention and bye from me.